Hey, Tanya, it's our first live stream. Hi, Ryan. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Here we go. Let me run. All right, here we are, the first live stream. We are live on both <laughs> Facebook and YouTube and just getting started. Right. Hopefully, we'll get some folks uh, coming to join us here. Yes, um, okay. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. A little bit nervous right now, but I'll, I'll work through it. It's always nice We're... when you're right next to me in this studio, you know? Right. So I'm up in Northern California at the remote studio, the remote shop. And then you are at uh, the Lost Mandy shop itself in your office, mm -hmm. of course. In my office. Yes. I love Great. My office. And uh, mm -hmm. before we get rolling, because uh, we got a lot of really fascinating ground to cover with Anthony Quintile, yeah. who's going to join us here in a moment. Uh, is there any announcements or things that you want to talk about that are Lost Mandy related? Um, well, I went every, I guess the one, the, we're kind of having a little bit of a supply chain. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call them issues. There's just some delays. So, you know, if there is a delay in, um, one of your mounts or a product, just please, uh, please be patient with us. We are, we're trying to be as proactive as we can be ordering way ahead of time, but it is, there's some challenges right now in some of the metal. So, right. Just this just, that. just the, 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 the national supply chains are just rough right now. Right. It is. Yeah. I haven't, I, All right, I guess, yeah. world, I guess worldwide, but you know, we do most of our stuff very local. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, just right now I can't even get metal. So. Right. <laughs> it's just like, and, uh, but AIC is coming up the advanced imaging mm -hmm. conference. So in some ways this is a, uh, a prelim test run. Mm -hmm. for the live stream that we intend on doing at the show. Yeah. So that's going to be fun. And that, I believe, is what, May 20th, 21st? May, tw May 20th and 21st, yes. Okay. I think and it's, it's a, a Friday, Saturday this year. Yeah. Which Friday, is a bit yeah, it's a Friday, Saturday, right? So I think we mm -hmm. arrive a day early to set up. We arrive, we leave a day late to sort of get everything sorted out. But last time they had was just 2019. It's an absolutely fantastic show for anybody doing imaging absolutely right. just the most you're going to learn in the in the least amount of time possible mm -hmm. Definitely. and we'll be there too right we'll be there yeah a lot of the vendors go to this one this is a big one for a lot of the astro imaging vendors fantastic yes uh, Manufacturers. okay so without any uh additional delay we're going to bring on anthony all uh, right anthony quintile anthony good to see you hi, hi anthony yeah. How are you? Uh, Thanks there for we on. go. There you are. There he is. <laughs> and you are joining us from where? From NGC 1788, as you can see in the background. <laughs> no, I'm actually, right. uh, I'm in Flagstaff, Arizona, um, the world's first dark sky city and home to uh, Lowell Observatory. So nice. Wow. Astronomy town. Beautiful, yes, beautiful. Is. And you have, uh, you have pretty good skies there, right? Yeah, where my house is, which is about 10 miles north of town, uh, I've measured at as high as a 21.7 on my FQM meter, uh, wow. which is born old three solidly. Uh, but it, depending on the night, and I'm you know I'm not a complete expert on using this tool, and but a, a dark four to a three is typically on the born old scale. And wow, the, uh, so so it's three four. Yeah, and the, the the downside is I'm on the the leeward side of a big mountain peak, so our seeing can be remarkably terrible. It can be it can be pretty good at times, but uh, it, you know, planetary imaging and lunar is really a challenge here. I've lucked out on a few nights when I've done that, but uh, for dark right. sky, deep, deep sky stuff, it's phenomenal. So nice. speaking of which, uh, we most recently crossed paths with you when you submitted this image to us uh, uh, and it won our image of the month for the newsletter. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. And can you just tell us a little bit about this target? Uh, about the target itself? Well, it's, it's in a it's sort of off the knee 
the front knee of Orion, um, okay. and it's a little north of Rigel. And um, I I shoot one shot color, so I, I like to choose targets that have a lot of dust and mixed colors. I, you know, um, something like Pillars of Creation is an amazing target, but it's mostly red, you know, and and there's a little blue in the corner in that area in the right. Nebula, but. But so this, I, I often will choose targets because they've got a lot of that white and brown dust as well as some mixed colors in the hydrogen alpha. And so, you know, this one doesn't have so much in the oxygen, but it has a little bit up there, I guess, or it might be actually glow in the clouds from a blue star. I'm not sure. I don't want to get right, lost in right. the science too much. But, you know, this has some blues in it and it's got a lot of that brown. And and, and so that's, that's why I chose the target. Um, also, I like to choose things that are attainable, but not maybe the most popular targets. Everybody shoots Orion, right? Nebula. Right, and, uh, right. of course. Portet. That's a start. It's a typical beginner target. And I've shot those things, and but it's, I think it's fun to try to get these other ones that maybe are a little, little neglected, but still really cool, cool objects. And I think this one falls into that category solidly. Right. Um, and I also, also like to choose based on framing, like, can I just barely fit it in my field, right? Because it's, you got all those pixels, let's use them all, you know? And so this one- So we, one when we saw this line. image of yours and we were very impressed by it, and then we went to your Astrobin page, which is probably a mistake on my part because I got super upset for a number of reasons we'll talk about in a good way, but upset nonetheless. But here is the, here is the image. I want to point out, this is the, uh, uh, Astro bin URL for you, Anthony, right? Well, that's okay. for this image, but yeah. Oh, for this image. Yes, you're right. I'm sorry. So let me go to, uh, your page, but I mean, going through these images, I mean, these are remarkable images. They really are. They're not only, uh, beautiful, uh, but they're well imaged. They're well processed. They have good color rendition. I mean, just kind of going through these, we realize that you're the kind of person that people want to talk to and learn more about how you did things, why are you doing things the way you're doing, the equipment you're using, the troubleshooting processes that you have in looking at some of these, right? Well, that's that's really flattering. And I it's funny because I there's there's a lot of other astrophotographers that I really look up to and I that inspire some of the, my choices and objects and how I process things and things like that. And I, I don't count myself amongst them yet. I've, I've just gotten back into astronomy for four years now. And I've, I've, you can ask my wife, I'm a little obsessed with it. I tend to do that with the things I get into, but um, I still feel like I have a long way to go. So that's really flattering, really nice of you to say, but uh, yeah, I'm happy to tell everybody all the ways I, I cheat at this and try to get good images. <laughs> Uh, so let's maybe start with, um, because I do have uh, some pictures. So um, let's talk about first how you got involved with uh, astro imaging. I mean, you haven't been doing this your entire life, right? No. So, well, no, but I, when I was a kid and so in the early 80s, you know, a young teenager, um, I... This, I was kind of a science nerd and I, I wanted to get into astrophotography. Um, so I, I actually had a Celestron Super C8. I had a T ring. I was going to use one of my dad's Nikons and I was going to try to shoot some images. And at that time, anybody has been, you know, looked into shooting on film and knows what's involved in that. Um, it's, and at that time, we didn't have auto guiding. So you had to stand in the cold with a, uh, uh, Binder scope with crosshair. Oh yeah, I remember guide, that. Guide with a joystick, and people were doing things like um, freezing their film. You know, using uh, cooler. Uh, I think actually dry ice to. I, I right. forget all the things and to then try to increase other, the sensitivity. Yeah. Yeah, and, and pushing their film and doing other stuff with hypersensitizing the film, and I, I never got into all that stuff. You know, I was at the age where I was into astronomy and just figuring my equipment out and then i got into girls and i got a car and 
<laughs> punk rock music and wanting to hang out and do cool kid things. And so um, <laughs> astronomy fell by the wayside. I sold my telescope a couple decades or a decade or so after that. And um, But then uh, about four years ago, it occurred to me, you know, we, we live out here. It's really dark, beautiful skies. I think we came home one night and I looked up and the, it was a really good night. It was really clear, yeah. really bright stars. Like, I need to get a telescope. So I got a, this Celestron, um, their 130 millimeter Newtonian. And I had that for, I think, about three weeks. And I was like, no, nah, I need a better telescope. Right. So I got an 8 SE and, and started trying to take pictures through it with my cell phone. And, uh, you know, that wasn't working. And so uh, I got a DSLR, a little Pentax, and then uh, realized that that mountain was going to cut it. And so one of my first major... Uh, high quality purchases was my Los Mandy G11. And um, I used that for a little bit uh, unguided because I didn't have all the equipment to guide it and then started trying to guide it. And, you know, it was all down right. from there. So, right. Of course. So uh, more recently, let's kind of, let's kind of, t and again, you are located in a suburb in Arizona, right? Well, Flagstaff is a small city, and I'm just on the outskirts of, of Flagstaff. We don't have suburbs, per se, in Flagstaff. We have the town, some outlying sort of neighborhoods, and then a lot of desert and mountains with hardly anybody on it. Got Navajo it. Nation's so, I mean, just north of us, a lot of spread out folks living up there, but all very spread yeah. out. A lot of low-density population here. But pr but pretty good skies, right? I mean, you're not in an urban environment, so you get a you know you get your shot at some some pretty good dark skies, right? Yeah, I don't. I use an, a UV IR cut filter only and a one shot colored camera. I don't have to use narrow band or something like that to get images and cut down got light it. pollution. Yeah. So let's we got some pictures of some of your gear. Uh, let's kind of walk through it a little bit. Uh, so first of all. Uh, this is your, uh, basic mount setup, right? Yeah. This was right after I installed my new pier out in our garden where we used to have a hot tub that we weren't using. Um, <laughs> is that what the hole is? Yeah. It's the hot tub fit in there and it's on a big slab. So this is bolted <laughs> to the slab that the hot tub was on. Um, we, uh, a nice had garden a out back. Yeah, my wife yeah. does a great job with that. Where she's got seedlings going right now. But one yeah. of the nice things was when the hot tub went, the ground squirrels that lived in it went with it. So we had nice. less fewer attacks <laughs> on the garden after that. <laughs> so this is so you, but you built. It looks like you have a built a pier. Yeah, I had this pier made by a local fabricator. Uh, quick funny story: when I went to pick this up, we have. Not only Lowell Observatory in town and then outlying, they have several different telescopes in the surrounding area, but we also have U.S. Naval Observatory here. So when I went to pick this up from the fabricator that I've worked with on other fun telescope related projects, I went to pick it up. I said, I'm here for that telescope part I had you guys made. And they say, oh, are you here for the thing for the Naval Observatory? And I thought, well, I guess I got my thing made at the right place. So, but yeah, I just literally back of a napkin type drawing and handed it to the local fabricator and they made this thing for me. So cut a custom pier and then yeah. you have what looks like a, a G11 on top. Yep. It's a G11 Gemini 2. I love this mount. You guys do a great job. It, it um, early on, I heard something to the effect of a good mount should disappear. You shouldn't think about it. And I don't think about it. It's never the mount. It's always me or it's always the seeing or something else and it just does what it's supposed to do and i keep thinking maybe i should take it apart and grease it or something like that but i'm like that's nah, <laughs> right good. yeah right. that sounds like brian <laughs> yeah so let's okay let's talk a little bit about what you have on the mount because we have another picture here and it looks like you have sort of a selection of uh telescopes that you kind of put on on at various times of the year or tell us about these so my goal was, as I mentioned earlier, I like to be able to frame an object as best as possible. You know, galaxy season is always a challenge because everything's very small, right? Or not everything. Most galaxies are very small. But I'd like to, I'd like to have options available to me. I mean, on top of this stuff, I have some uh, SLR lenses that um, I've yet to use with my uh, ASI camera, but I've used with a DSLR for different framings and comet shots and things like that. But 
So I like to be able to frame things differently. So I have that stellar view. It's an SVX ADT that I use with a uh, field flattener at 480 millimeters, but then I'm going to forget the focal length. But I also use a Starzona um, uh, 0.65 reducer on that as well. So that gives me mm -hmm. a real, you know, shorter focal length range. And then I have this uh, Skywatcher um, 250p, so the 10 inch. It's endemically f4 to 1,000 millimeters, but then I use the Sky uh, the uh, the Starzona. Uh, Focal reducer at 0.75, so 750 millimeters f3, and I I joke that that's a poor man's Rasa, just it's so fast and still long focal length, longish at 750 millimeters. I, that's that's probably my favorite setup. And then I have the Celestron 9.25, and I use that mostly entirely with the um, 0.63 Starzona uh, reducer corrector, their SCT corrector four. And um, although I do do some planetary and and uh, the lunar stuff occasionally, and, and with a Barlow and a different camera with the uh, ASI two hundred and ninety MC. Sure, sure. So so basically, I have this huge range that you know focal lengths from in the mid three hundreds up through two thousand or four thousand millimeter or twenty three fifty and forty six hundred millimeters, and with nice steps in between. So it gives me a lot of options depending on what I want to shoot. Okay. Hey guys, you know how this is our first um, live stream podcast and I don't really know how to operate it. And Brian <laughs> just kind of told me a little bit of how to do this. So I'm going to interrupt. Okay. Cause okay. we do have a couple of comments here that I'd like to say, I know you guys have probably, if you uh, watch our Facebook page or, um, and I think he's one also one of our images of the month. His name is Steven or Mr. Rat is uh, his name, but oh, he yeah. is an amazing imager. Um, I love, he has, I, I want to say a G11 out there. And he's so Mr. Awesome. Rat, he's showing got, us the he's rat. He's got a great website too. Um, but he's he comments here. He says he's getting some nice blues. Okay, that was on one of your images. Yeah, um, that's probably the mm -hmm. NGC 1788 yeah. maybe. Yeah. And then I also have Dawn Romero here online. And she wanted to say, why didn't you go for the Williams cold camera? I, I think that might have been a comment about shooting film because I don't even recognize Maybe. that name. And I, that was, uh, that was before, you know, that's back when wheels were square and stuff. So I don't really remember what, I, I never made it to taking photos, honestly, when I was a kid through the telescope. I, I, but it was something that I was inspired about and, and something I felt I had left undone. So that's how, kind right. of why I came back to it as an adult. Um, right, I'm right. glad I did. And I'm glad I kind of did it in the meantime, because I think we're at a really neat point in technological history for telescope gear. It's really pretty, I don't want to say it's easy. There's a lot to learn and it's complicated, but it's not shooting film and auto gu or, or manually guiding all night in the cold, you know, it's, no, it's right. not, it's attainable well, that's, and I, accessible, you know? Yeah. Especially when you can have a computer inside, you're kind of in the warmth of your own home or people build observatories or whatever nowadays. So it is, I think a little bit right. more, um, nicer environment to be able to do astrophotography in. Absolutely. I mean, there's folks who literally set up their rigs and go to bed and I, I, I mean, I like to see what's going on. And so I end up staying up, but uh, nonetheless, I, you, you couldn't have done anything close to that in the, in the eighties with the equipment. Right. Available. Yeah. yeah. So I was lucky enough to be on a um, tour. It was a private tour at Mount Wilson of the, I think it's the hundred inch telescope. Um, where uh, Hubble and some other folks made some fantastic discoveries. I mean, this thing is absolutely a monstrous telescope, but they were talking about imaging back in the days, and I think this is kind of in the 60s uh, time frame, but they would do it on large uh, uh, film plate, uh, large format film, and the images would take literally hours, if not uh, days, uh, to image. So, you know, you sort of put the slide, the dark slide on the film. At the end of the day, you'd... Uh, set it aside. And then the next night you come back out and you put it in and you pull it up. But when they talked about, they had to manually guide this thing. And there was a guy on a platform and he would just have to sit there and look in his little reticle and move these things to guide it. 
And it got so cold because Mount Wilson is actually pretty, even though it's in an LA area, it's pretty high up on the mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, they ended up repurposing uh, spacesuits that are climate controlled <laughs> so that these people could literally not freeze to death. And they would just sit there, you know, dialing these things in all, all night long. It's a completely different world now. It, it really is. And uh, yeah, I, I, amateurs that uh, occasionally I'll see some film images and you have to scale your expectations and then you will ga gain an appreciation for what some folks produced. And at that time, you know, the, I, the hot telescope at that time was the Schmidt cameras that you could get from Celestron. Mm -hmm. I've seen people attempting to repurpose those to put a, a sensors in them, but you'd actually put a, a little cut strip of film in there and it would, the, film would be bent to a certain angle on the holder for the film to deal with the 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 um the way the light distorts with that setup to, to get a flat image on the on the film so you know and those were fast and so you could actually take an image in a reasonable amount of time but you still had to manually guide you still had to stand in the cold absolutely and, yeah so let's talk about i want to get back to your um uh, your setups here, because in particular, I want to talk about this Newtonian. Now, I actually have, as you might be able to see, I have a nearly identical Newtonian behind me, the 10 inch F4 right. from Skywatcher. Mm -hmm. Yep. <clears throat> Up until now, and by now, I mean maybe within the last few months, I have not given this a thought in terms of imaging. It was primarily for visual, maybe a little planetary. And then I got really interested seeing your images, you know, in this one that you did, uh, the, let me sort of back up the slide here. Um, I, this one, this is, how many hours did you do on this? I think it was 32 hours, 40 something minutes. I was just looking at that a while ago because I knew you might be asking me. So yeah. Yes. It's, it's, it's almost 33 hours. Yeah. And these are a lot of time. And how, and what is your typical integration time? Per, so per sub. My my goal recently, past several months, has been I want to get basically 30 hours on anything. We've been having a remarkably cloudy and uh, winter here in Flagstaff, so I haven't been able to do that on the last couple of images. They've both been brighter objects, so I've been able to pull something off that was good. And, but this one's relatively dim. If you look at objects, even wide field, and find this thing on it, and wide field, uh, you know, it's Orion, so there's a lot of images out there. It's interesting because you'll see this is pretty dim, and where Witch's Head shows up, and certainly Great Orion Nebula and Horse Head and, and Flame, those guys are showing up. But this guy, you'll barely see it even in some real nice wide field shots just for comparison within that field. So it's a pretty dim object, and I knew I was going to have to put a bunch of time into it. Um, right, and, but 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 let me just interject. You're talking about 30 hours at f3, right? Yeah, so it's fast, right? So that's using that star zone corrector, uh, a reducer corrector, and on a telescope that's already f4, and to get it f3. Right. So just by comparison, because I have a um, well, let me pick my um, 10 inch. I have a 10 inch RC. It's a GSO brand. It's an f8. So your 30 hours at F3 is roughly, you know, it's maybe two, a little over, maybe t t almost three stops faster. So in order for me to get the equivalent exposures on an F8 scope, we are talking 30, 60, 120, maybe 240 hours, 200 hours, somewhere in there. I mean, that's an astonishing amount of data that you're picking up in part because you have such a fast setup. Yeah, that's I, I, what I say, and I, I, I joke it's a poor man's Rasa. You know, the, that, those, those imaging Newtonians from Skywatcher, I don't know with the inflation and the market the way it's been, but I think I paid eight fifty for mine or something like that, brand new. And then that star zone reducer correctors for 480 or something, I, I don't know, but it's, you know, sub $500. So we're around thirteen hundred dollars. You've got right. a, you know, it, uh, where a, a ten inch, seven hundred fifty millimeter f three scope. So you've got that that resolution ability that the bigger aperture will give you. Um, and where whereas you'd have to get a, you know 
comparable rasa you'd need an 11 inch rasa those things are like four right five grand or something right that's true okay so let's go let's go back to uh this newtonian okay because and I, what i'd like you to do uh i don't think i'm that unusual in terms of like okay it's pretty good kind of feels a little cheap but i i can't help but look at these images and say what did you do to this telescope like how did you get this thing into an imaging kind of monster like you must have done obviously you put the 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 reducer in there but there i see some other gear in there i see this sort of looks like a diy fan kind of thing can you just kind of walk through what you did to ensure that this thing is producing the kind of images that you're that you're showing us so since we have this image up i'll start with the fan this was um I don't know what this plastic is called, but I got it from the hardware store. It's just this sheet plastic. It cuts easily with a razor blade, but it's pretty substantial. I've actually crashed that thing in the mount a couple of times and it hasn't broken so or deformed substantially. So it, it's flexible, but substantial enough. And then I uh, I got a, uh, a fan and that black material that sort of acts as a seal around the fan was the stuff the fan came packed in. It was sort of the perfect rubbery foam so i i cut that up and shaped it properly and, and glued it on right. the ca to sort of seal around the fan and i'm drawing air out of the back of the telescope so basically pulling air down the tube it works really well i i um tested this using incense smoke to see how quickly it was pulling air and it's remarkable how quickly it can pull air i actually turned this i i, I set up really high to cool in the evening and get it down to temperature but then I turn it down so I don't get any vibrations from the fan or, or anything like that. But this was, and I, I'm not an expert on this, but it's my understanding there's a barrier layer on uh, mirrors that can cause your resolution to be a little less. And, and so I was like, okay, well, I think I can address that. So I built this little thing for it. And that if, if nothing else, it just keeps the mirror um, at ambient temperature, gets it there quicker and keeps it there throughout the evening so right minimize so that so it pulls air uh from the front of the tube and i assume there's a hole in this uh white uh plastic thing yeah the the square around the fan actually just friction fits over the fan so the, right. the, it, that's all hollow and the fan is it's transparent if you will the whole way through where the fan is in that square uh. shape Gotcha. Rubber, okay. That rubberized material friction fits it on. I actually think I have a rubber band around that black stuff now just to give it a little snugger of a fit. Um, it breaks occasionally. I replace it. So. And do, do you leave this on pretty much the entire time? Do you ever take this off when you're imaging? Not while I'm imaging. No, I have to take it off to put my cover on it. So, but no, not while I'm imaging. It just sits on there and I turn the fan down. So it's drawing air gently through the tube the whole time. And it, so this, the fan's running the entire time you're imaging. Yeah, like I said, there's a phenomenon with this temperature difference between the mirror and ambient that creates supposedly a barrier layer on a, on a mirror, as I understand. And I'm not an expert in this, just read about it a, a bit to understand that it's a phenomenon that can deteriorate how good your mirror's performing, how well your mirror's performing. So I was like, a lot of people will do a fan that'll draw air across the mirror, so on the side. Um, but this seems like a little easier way to, to, to deal with this and get the fan mounted uh, to the scope and not drill holes in my tube and such. So um, this oh, wow. was a goal. This was a, an attempt at executing that. I don't know that it helped. I know I know it helps keep it get the mirror cool faster. Uh, we Can have... I interject for a second, you guys? I'm sorry. Sure. Two yeah. seconds. Um, I, I want to say hi. There's David Rico from Spain is on. Hello, David. Hi, David. Uh, Good to hear from you. Um, but I did have a question for you, um, Anthony, from I think it's Dawn. Um, she says, have you noticed, and it might be a little bit delayed um, in, in what you guys were talking about. I'm still trying to learn this. Um, have you noticed any decrease in contrast going from F7 to F3? And I think that's um, probably F4 to F3, right? Yeah, I because this scope is endemically F4 and then F3 with the reducer. And I, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, if anything, I just, I'm getting enough light that it allows me to mess with the contrast and get, you know, less, less, have less color noise and things like that. I'm just getting so much data that, that things like that become 
easy to it's contend with in processing. So. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so the, the fan is the one upgrade that I, I, I did, and it's, it's a little low end, right? But it works. It, it accomplishes the goal. Um, yeah, I'm just surprised that because a, I hear a lot of chatter online about fans and how fans create vibration and how fans ruin shots. And I'm not talking, a, you know, this is a really big fan. I'm talking about fans like in the camera for the cooler, things like that. And you, in your experience, you can just leave it on and it's no, it's no big deal. I do turn it down. So it's not running as fast when I'm imaging as when I Ooh. set it up to cool down through the evening, you know, as it gets dark. Cause, uh, right. But I, I did have absolutely an issue with the fan in my 2600 MC Pro. Um, and I, I, it was pure science. You could turn the fan off, turn the cooler off and the full with half maximum would drop and you know on three second exposures or whatever and the stars would become round again and then you turn it on and they'd become oval huh, and, interesting and so it's a cheap and easy and quick replacement i bought another fan and there's one that there's a whole discussion on cloudy nights about this so you can refer back to a search on cloudy nights because i wouldn't be able to dig it up but um about this other fan that's a smoother running fan definitely quieter than the stock fan same size and spec and voltage. You have to do a little uh, adapting of the old plug uh, from the old fan to make it fit in the camera or connect right. to the plug in the camera. But that fan hasn't given me any vibration errors, uh, uh, issues at all. They, um, and it was $16 and took, I think, 20 minutes the first time to install it. And the next time it'll take me five. So if nice. I have an issue again, I actually have a fan it out in the garage an extra one so that i'm ready to got go. it so but, maybe we'll try to uh dra we'll try to dig up that link uh after the streamcast and uh maybe put it on our description or something like that yeah that it's a it's a useful thing for folks that might be running into that but i i, I need to point out i i demonstrably i could you could see the difference turning it on and off in real time in the in the image and it was driving me nuts i think it was actually on my schmidt cast grain and I was, I'm like, what am I doing wrong to, to collimate? I can't get these stars to be round. <laughs> wow. And, but I could get them to be round. I think that, you know, it would vibrate one way. And the, so if the collimation's off a little bit in the corner, then you get a circle, right? The if it's off the other way. So I, it was driving me crazy. And when I finally figured that out, it was kind of a relief that it was, you know, I was chasing the wrong thing at the time. So. So speaking of which, let's talk about collimation because it's a reflector. So collimation is important for these types of telescopes. What is your collimation tool of choice for this? I'm using the cat's eye system and it's a little fuzzy to learn at first, but it's entirely manual. It doesn't require any, any lasers that also require their own collimation or anything like that. It can be done in the house in daylight, which is always a blessing you don't have to be out in the cold right and trying to do something in the dark and not being able to see what you need to see and seeing what you don't or, or what don't want to see but um it's a remarkably great tool uh to have and i highly recommend it i have found with that collimator when i have this go out on the mount doing it during daylight um that I can see there, there's some, there's a big telescope and it's got some flexure and some things. And sure. if I point the scope straight up, which is where I typically collimate because that's neutral, right? It's not leaning one way or the other. And if I slew the scope down a little bit, I can see a little bit of, uh, the collimation goes out a tiny bit. I, I think the cat's eyes, uh, tolerance is so tight that it's beyond what is really noticeable at these focal lengths at this resolution um, in your final images. Uh, so I think there was an object I was shooting, actually it might've been this object shooting kind of close to the eye, horizon. If I would zoom in while I was live stacking, I use, um, I use sharp cap, but if, if I zoom in to the, I, some of my stars looked a little localized, but in the end result, uh, that wasn't really noticeable. Uh, I think perhaps the uh, meridian flip and um, the rejection algorithms in Pix and Sight when I'm stacking throw out 
some of that variation enough to, to eliminate it. So sure. But but nonetheless, the, the, the cat's eye is very easy to use. It's very confidence inspiring. When you're collimated with that, you're collimated. You're good to go. Okay. So that's and that's now. a really nice thing to to have, I think, in the hobby is something that you know you're good. If, if you're there, you're good. So that's good. Um, I have a question. I don't know if either of you guys could answer this question. It's from Tom G. Hi, Tom G. How are you? Hey, Tom. Um, Thanks for joining us. <laughs> says here, you live in probably Bortle 3 Skies. Where do you go if you want Bortle 1 Skies? And do you have a portable rig? I don't I, know if that's for either of you or both of you. Probably both of you. I, th I think it's probably Anthony. Okay. So I do live in 3. And there's a two very close by, uh, just outside of the boundaries of Wapatki National Monument in the National Forest. On a, we've got a paved hey, parking lot out there that's for a trailhead that's a nice place to go. And then um, there's one, some Bortle One stuff out um, on North Rim of Grand Canyon, which is a long drive. But I think there's some other stuff uh, just just across the highway I'd have to go out some dirt roads and set out on some ranch, set up out on some ranches. But I, it's interesting when you, you start looking at the, the, you know, photons per minute of sky pollution and how it affects your imaging and, and three down to one. I mean, it, one would be nice. Right. But I, I'm getting, right. I'm getting the results I want in three and I, without filters and I uh, can use my peer and sit in my house. So, so are well, you, are you actually traveling at all to go to these uh, available darker skies? I have in the past. I have imaged out near Wapaki, but now that I have that pier installed, it's just too easy to go out, take the cover off, right. plug the right. laptop in, and and hook up over the net and start taking images. And I bet, yeah, I haven't That's run what... into any any need to go out there since. Yeah, I've heard that set the whole setting up process and everything, the easier that you make it, the more that you're going to do this. So have you yeah, found that? Yeah, there's a joke. So I'm not going to take credit for this joke because it's a good one. Somebody asked this guy, he said, well, what do you use as a light pollution filter? He said, gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, you know me. Right over, yeah. right over my head. Well, <laughs> well they, you know, the, the best light pollution filter is the one where you drive to dark skies, of course. Right? Oh, right. oh, oh, got it. Okay. So you always have to explain jokes to Tanya. Yeah. She does, I don't <laughs> but I, ever. I, so I will tell you from, from my personal experience, um, you know, I, I, I was in uh, the valleys in Los Angeles and they were, I call them Bortle 9 plus. Like I don't, I don't, I think that maybe we saw Sirius and possibly one other star oh, yeah. uh, and the moon, and that was about it. So yep. I would put 50, 60 hours into a target and barely be able uh, to get anything out of it, broadband, narrowband, or otherwise. It was just terrible. So now that I'm living in uh, Northern California, I have sort of Bortle 5 skies, 5, 6, and boy, it just makes all the difference that in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and like Anthony, I just, I really appreciate being able to image from my backyard, but I also have uh, remote access to the telescope setup that we have in Chile in the Atacama right. Desert. And so every afternoon, somewhere around three o'clock, I log in remotely and you know pull it up and kind of double check my targets. And in the morning, I open up my Dropbox and there's a whole bunch of frames there just waiting for me. So that's a you know that kind of uh, approach I think is becoming more and more popular nowadays. Right. Yeah, I see a lot of stuff where people are, are buying time on telescopes or pulling data from from these remote rigs, and mm -hmm. um, that stuff's great. I, it's amazing seeing those images. I I really take a lot of joy personally in troubleshooting everything from the ground up and having my own rig out in the, in the garden. And um, but I could see knowing that your data is as good as it can reasonably be, and and. I'll tell you, there's something about those meter telescopes, and when they're especially on things like those ga small galaxies, and you see those images, and I was like, and I'm just like, man, when I shot that, I just got a little yellow blob, but this guy's getting all the dust lanes in that. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. So there's so. a guy named uh, Mike Selby and Mark Hansen. These two guys are making the rounds on the internet, and uh, Mike has i he's in the same observatory i don't think we're in the same roof but he's i think next door to us uh and and this is down in, in the atacama desert chile a place called obstat he's got i think a 24 inch 
uh, possibly a 17 inch and he's got a one meter and these are all his personal telescopes. And these guys are just churning out data and targets. Uh, and I'm telling you, they are rivaling Hubble. I mean, it's it, it, you look up these guys and go onto Facebook and see what they're doing. It's astonishing. And we should probably drag them onto the show at some point because it's just fascinating to see how two private citizens are out there just crushing it. Well, one meter scopes really weren't available to the public sector a long, you know, a long time ago. The, uh, the, I, yeah, they were incredibly expensive, right? And right. I think, I think, I think the rule of thumb is a million dollars per meter, if I'm not mistaken. And now Plane Wave is doing a two meter telescope, so I can pretty much figure out what that's going to cost. Right. Oh my gosh. I I think well. it's cool. One of my favorite things is is um today actually today's image of the day on uh, Astrobin. The phenomenal shot of the um, oh, I'm I'm blanking on the name right now, but there's a, a galaxy. It's sort of a little too far south for me here, but it's it's yeah some, some jets, some some hydrogen alpha jets, and there it this is. This image was shot with an eight inch Ritchie Crescian, and it's just incredible. And I it's it's rivaling some of that meter stuff in my opinion. So, yeah, I think this is it, right? Uh, yeah, that's it right there. In the, I think it's thirty six oh three. Right there, that that image. Yeah, it's. So uh, it tell me. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't say anything. Okay, CPU. well, forget that. Oh, won't let you click on that. Uh, well, let's click right on there. it. Let's see here. Oh, here we yeah, go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's 36. So it's a yeah, GSO RC. Yeah. A Twenty. This it, is just basic equipment, and I love that stuff. You know, I, that's those are that's my that's my challenge is to be able to produce stuff that's. It's. Yeah. It's, Right up, it's as good as the equipment will do. You know what I mean? That's 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 isn't that impressive for an eight inch scope? And he's got yeah. those hydrogen alpha jets, and yeah, I just I was really yeah. And th stuff. these jets are tricky to get, man. Let me tell you, I've been trying he's, to get those. Uh, um, he's got 60, 68 hours on this if you look down on his stats. So, yeah, that's yeah, you know, it's, that's that's just crazy. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna steal your joke. There's a joke, and here's my version of it. What's my um, favorite noise reduction filter? And it's remote observatory, you know, yeah. because <laughs> of all the things that go wrong, and a lot of stuff does go wrong, quite wrong, uh, noise is never really a huge issue with uh, the images that we produce down there. So love that. Just, you know, kind of throw in a few 10, 12 more hours, and uh, it just it's just incredible. Yeah, de definitely. That's nice. And, and yeah, long exposures will get you there too, but big telescopes make it easier as well. So, so let's talk about, I want to go back to, uh, uh, back to your stuff here. Um, so uh, the Newtonian, you've got the reducer. This is the star zona, what 0.75 reducer. Yeah, it's the, I wrote down the name cause they've got, I was, They've got names for things. It's their Nexus, their 0.75 Nexus reducer. And I, I love that reducer on this scope. I think it's the just the coolest setup because, you know, you're talking about noise. Well, if you can get you shooting at F3 and I'm at uh, just a little tiny bit over an arc second to a pixel right. with my, it's a 2600 MC ASI camera. Um, you know, when you're starting to be able to put that much light on for, on every pixel, it's, it, it makes things so much easier and kills that signal noise problem that is the problem, right? Right. Um, so focus is probably critical, and it looks like you have maybe uh, – what What do you have for the autofocuser there? It's in, is, uh, ZW EAF, and um, I, the one little trick, if somebody has a scope with a stock focuser using a, an autofocuser for astrophotography – a little trick that I figured out is if you snug up, it's got two screws that sort of buffer the um, lateral play in the focuser. And so you, you got to find just that perfect snugness of the, the, the screws to make sure there's not a lot of lateral slop. Uh, so your focus doesn't change as you slew or as you uh, track across the sky. Right. So um, that was a little trick I figured out recently. It wasn't a big deal. Just made, I would get these, weird occasional big jumps and focus up. They're actually not that big when you start to realize how small they are, but nonetheless, at F3, focus is pretty critical, and I focus pretty frequently. I focus 
uh, as a th- you know, our temperature can swing from the 70s during the day to the 50s at night, sure, uh, pretty quickly. So as I the early evening, I focus pretty frequently as frequently as every 20 minutes or so. That that's where all the temperature drop is really happening. Yeah, and then yeah. you know, 10, 11 o'clock, I'm able to. I'll check it every 40 minutes or hour. Um, so it holds focus. I did um, for the uh, my secondary collimation in the spider. I I thought it was pretty tight. I was concerned, you know, it's just barely starting to dimple the tube to tell you how tight it is because I didn't put a mm-hmm. torque wrench on it. But I found that making that secondary pretty tight and i spent a lot of time centering it i made some uh some little templates using um i think photoshop or something we drew some circles and made some cross uh hairs on them just to make right angle inserts to make sure my measurements and i had the secondary centered properly and right and had that really tight so it gets the least amount of flexure out of the, the secondary assembly um I'm trying to think, but I, I haven't done a lot more than that. I tried to put a different uh, dovetail on it, but it occurred to me that that's not that's not where I'm, it, you could put a bigger dovetail, but it's not between the dovetail and the clamp on the G11 where you get flexure. It's really just uh, the rings. Uh, sure, that's where you get your stiffness there. So I didn't see much point in doing a secondary or a uh, the bigger dovetail, and I was going to have to drag right. half some things and get crazy. So. Well, so you have, it looks like, uh, <laughs> so you've got the 2600 MC camera, you've got the uh, ZWO EAF, and it's, it looks like it's strapped to the stock focuser. You would mentioned a couple of uh, tips on that. Star zona reducer, cat's eye collimator, and it looks like you might be, is that a guide camera there that's in the, in the, off to the back of that? Yeah, this is just the ASI 120mm mini. Um I, that's coming up short a little bit for me with my OAG. I might have to spring for the 174 because it does, it has a pretty small sensor. And using the off-axis guider on the Schmidt Cassegrain, um, I'm at the longer focal length, about 1480 millimeters. Sure. I, I was having a hard time finding a star on the last image I took, which was uh, NGC um, 45. 4565 is that it uh-huh the uh the ufo galaxy i think you called it oh right it's yeah. uh that's you just had that on here right so let's see here and yeah. i i knew i was going to crop that image so i was able to nudge the scope around until i found a guide star but i wasn't really able to multi-star guide and that becomes important yeah this one right here right so this is uh boy look at that just you know just razor sharp Uh, well done. That's it. Yeah, that's so that's so nice. I think you sent that to me, and I was like, "Whoa!" Yeah, I think we may have lost. By the way, I think we lost him. <laughs> oh, okay. So that's um, okay. it's our first time. It's our first time. It's going yeah. good, though. Yeah. So hopefully we'll come back here for a second. But Anthony was telling me that uh, it's a stock. It, it kind of horrified me, but it's a stock focuser. Um, I'm sorry. It's a stock. Uh, guide camera and guide scope. Okay. And he has it hooked into the finder scope uh, connector, which, and I think he's using rings on it as well, which are all totally no, 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 no's, right. You're not supposed to do any (laughs) of that kind of stuff. Uh, And, uh, and yet, you know, you just really can't argue with these, these type of results. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Although are pretty amazing. Yeah, so although he was um, talking about all these things, he targets, I think, around about 120 seconds, so two minutes in the uh, uh, subframe exposures, what he was telling me. I don't know if that's, you know, I don't know if that's a limitation in terms of the, the guiding. I don't know if that's a limitation in terms of he's just gathering so much data that right. that's just kind of happening. Um but uh, it was a really, I mean, these are just some really, really astonishing uh, results. And I'm just, uh, you know, I'm pretty amazed by all this stuff. So as I see Anthony's uh, back now. So we're, we, okay. we were just talking a little bit about your subframe times, Anthony, and that you, I think, targeted about 120 seconds or so. 
on the F3 setup I do on the, this one that we've got up on the screen right now, I'm at four minutes and I should, I maybe should go longer. I, I really should get it. SharpCap has some, some uh, functionality to give you recommended minimum exposure times based upon your sky brightness and things like that. And I haven't implemented that yet. So I, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of the time. And my main, my main determiner for what my exposure should be is long enough, but not so long that I oversaturate bright stars in the field or blow the, sure. br blow the brighter stuff out. So, um, and that's entirely subjective based upon my experience with using the camera and seeing what seems to work or not. Um, and uh, so I, I, there's not a lot of science behind that, how I'm doing it at the moment. And I know there's okay. tools available, but. I want to talk for a moment and I want to change subjects now. And I want to talk about your mount um, because uh, when you first started out, as I understood it, and I know Tanya has something to say about this, but uh, you guys, you were not happy and you were, your mount was not performing in the way that you needed it to. That's not true. My mount was performing perfectly. However, my telescope was not, and it actually took me several months to figure out what was wrong with the telescope, although I resolved the issue I was having in a much shorter amount of time. Right, right. I was using yeah. a Schmidt Cassegrain. I was using the um, Celestron 8SE that had come with my my uh, uh, package that you get from Celestron with their right. Their, uh, and yeah, so, we were you ahead, replaced Tanya. the Lost Mandy mount with the C gem that it came with, right? Is that correct? No, oh, no, okay, no, sorry. it did. No, it didn't come with a C gem. It comes with this. Um, I, I'm forgetting the the Celestron. CGX. No, it's not. It's a, it's an alt azimuth entry uh, level. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. So right. I had taken it off of there and put it on the Los Mandy. Um, so once I started guiding, that's where I I ran into this issue, and I was guiding using this this guide scope, not an off-axis guider, and that ASI 120mm like I have on my other on the reflector in that image you had up previously. Right. And so what was happening, and I'm going to sort of cut to the end and then come back. So what, what was really happening is that the mirror in my 8SE was not a pro properly affixed to the focus um, tube. Right. The, the, the focusing baffle tube. Right. And so what was happening is the mir mirror was actually slowly moving as the scope was, uh, was tracking across the sky. Like shifting, right? It right, was slowly right. shifting just with gravity right. and and the of course the images uh, the um, guide ca scope and guide camera were staying fixed to the rest of the assembly and it was guiding perfectly and the mount was working perfectly but what i i was able to actually create a short animation i said look here's these stars shifting across my field of view right and my mind mount was going too slow i'm new to this this is you know i this was as i said i had just gotten back into this there's a million things to know. This is one million and three that I'm trying to figure out. And right. And so it was frustrating because I felt like, well, I'm guiding. My guide graph looks good. Everything else is good. So the advice. But your images were had so all Anthony, stars. Right? right. And so Anthony was calling us all the time. And um, what's wrong with my mount? What's wrong with my mount? What's wrong with my mount? And us trying to troubleshoot because there's so many things to this, to an imaging setup. It's hard for myself or uh, Scott to try to troubleshoot. And so we thought it was like polar alignment, you know, which is a, a result of having oblong stars. And um, Anthony was just like, I don't know. I, I, I not happy. Right. Right. And um, so we were trying to troubleshoot with them. He says that I was being very patient. Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> But in the long run, and so I think what I'm trying to, why I'm speaking right now is I, I want people to try not to rabbit hole down just one rabbit hole when you're trying to figure out what is causing your setup, what you're causing oblong stars or something like that. Because as Anthony is explaining, as I interrupted, he's explaining where it was actually coming from. So I'll let you finish. So, so ultimately the solution, the short term solution, because we, I didn't know I had a essentially defective telescope and I'll give Celestron due props here in a second, but um, 
was the, the general advice with a Schmidt Cassegrain to use an off axis guide, or especially the bigger, this is an eight inch, so shouldn't sure. have to, right? But uh, the, uh, the bigger scopes, the 11s and the 14s, especially the advice is because the mirrors do move a little bit to use an off axis guider and then you're guiding on, you know, guiding out that any mirror shift you might get. So I got an right, off axis right. guider and um, everything was good. I was suddenly able to get round stars. I, I didn't, you know, wasn't getting any drift in my images at all. And I shot that way for a while, but then eventually, you know, fast forward several months and I'm back. I, I started using a, uh, my, my stellar view more. Um, which obviously a guide with the, and that, this was the other thing is that I had a small Astrotech refractor at the time. This was one of the, the clues, sure. right? I could guide sure. that one. No problem. When I put that on. So that points to, you know, it was, a, I think that was probably one of the things that led to me solving the issue with my guiding ultimately. And so I ended up, uh, eventually going back to the Schmidt Cassegrain and trying to to nail that down and I, I could just couldn't, I could collimate, but it wouldn't, you'd slew to one side of the sky, it'd be out one way, you'd slew the other side, it'd be out the other way. Right. The collimation is different depending on the, the side of the yeah. pier you're on. It, exactly. And so then yeah. I got a discussion going on cloudy nights and the gist of that, I forget what I said exactly, but I said, basically you can't really collimate a Schmidt Cassegrain or what. And somebody said, so you just have a problem with those telescopes. I'm like, no, it just doesn't seem like this is right, that anybody should accept this as being a good platform if this is normal. And I think a few people said, yeah, that shouldn't be the case. And so I mm -hmm. ended up sending it back to Celestron. And they were great. They actually took the mirror out and they I, I followed up when they were sending it back to me. And it was all under warranty. They covered it. It was great. And uh, I said, yeah. so what did, you, what did you guys do? And he said, well, we spun the mirror. And I guess what that means is they detach the mirror fully from the um, the focuser baffle tube, and then they reinstall it with new adhesive and spin it to center it. Nice. And, like uh, a centrifugal kind of thing? Yeah, that's my understanding, and I that's, yeah. that's as much as I know. But that, he said, well, we spun the mirror. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? He said, well, that's, you know, if we have to re-glue it. So after yeah. I got nice that thing. back, after I got that back, it was great. I had actually sent it out to another place to try to have them try to collimate it or make sure my corrector was centered and you know i got it blocked and some other stuff and so it wound up being maybe the best eight se for deep sky astrophotography ever but once it was done <laughs> being touched by all these experts in the field yeah but, but um nonetheless i just it's it's just sort of testament to the complexity and 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 you know I, i'm into motorcycles a little bit there was a, a joke somebody made on a forum once he said if you posted on this forum that you had a flat tire, everybody would run out of the garage and check if they had one too. So please, your mirror on your your Celestron is probably fine. I had an, but I did have an anomalous issue with my telescope. It's not something that a beginner should be expected to figure out easily, right? But it led to me making assumptions about my mount, which were not true, and and made it frustrating to solve. Right. And, and that's, I think you point out a good thing. Be, and, and let me just share with you a similar experience I had because I have a, a Takahashi Sky 90 refractor, uh, which is incredibly well built. It's not a particularly sophisticated refractor. It does have a fluorite element, which is great. Uh, it's probably um, 10, 12 years old, but it is a solid refractor right and there's no mirror there's no mirror shift anything like that i have a reducer on it so i think it's a 405 millimeter f 3.8 is what it ends up being i mean it should be relatively easy to use a telescope like this and yet as i was doing uh in my case i was doing a uh, periodic error correction i was just slewing to the intersection of the celestial equator and the meridian running it for an hour unguided and I would watch the lines going across and there would always be these sort of big chunk and then it would move. And then there, you know, 10, 20 minutes later, there'd be another big substantial movement. And I was like, my God, you know, this mount is terrible. Like what is happening to this thing? Uh, so the long and short of it is I found out that on the Takahashi, the focuser tube, unless you tighten it using the little screw on the bottom, 
has some movement to it and kind of flops up and down. So as things moved across the sky, it kind of just flopped a little bit. Just, you know, not much. I mean, we're talking about fractions of the width of a human hair, but those show up in these graphs right. you know, as monstrous movements. And I thought, like you, well, it can't be, it can't be the mirror or anything. It can't be the telescope because this is a refractor. And yet when I went back and I, I tightened that piece down, you know, I, I can't do it uh, as a permanent solution because I have a focuser on there. It's just got to be able to focus. It can't be tightening it down. But when I tightened that down, that problem went away. And it just goes to show you the tools that we have to evaluate our, our performance of our system as a whole are things like guiding and tracking and oftentimes we want to point out the at the mount as the problem and sometimes it is i'm not saying like mounts are perfect right right but it's really really easy to confuse the symptoms uh with what is the actual problem right yeah that, i don't it's, i don't think it's just uh, i mean the issues specific things we're talking about are you know seem positioning guiding tracking related but there's a million things that you could be pointing over here and it's over there uh, right. if anything. And uh, frankly, that, that focuser thing you bring up with those adjuster knobs, I find that with, obviously the Celestron is different because of the way the focus right. works. But my my stellar view, their focuser is a fine focuser, but it, it is necessary to, to tighten that set screw in just enough to minimize that amount of lateral play. And then I mentioned it on the, the reflector that I've done that that the i think unless you you only use really high end focusers that are machined to super duper tight tolerances right you, you know is, yeah the, these are some things that the types of things you run into that you may not even find a big discussion on cloudy nights or a, a facebook forum about these things are just the things that people figure out along the way and right don't get mentioned and so there's a there I've are, even oh. had people where the T adapter wasn't tightened enough and and it was the hardest thing to figure out, you know. So Yeah, and well there's a, T adapters have a little they have the 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 M42 threaded part. A lot of them have a second piece. It slips inside that has the Pentax or Canon or Nikon ring right, right. to it. And they're held in place by these tiny little set screws that nobody ever <laughs> notices until they're a problem around the outside. And exactly. So, yeah, that, that's a thing that people won't notice, and that could be causing your camera to rotate once it hits meridian or whatever. Yes. The balance point. Right. Yeah. So it's really important to look at everything. That's for sure. So let's. Uh, I want to talk briefly about uh, troubleshooting, and then I do want to make sure that we get on to. Let's take a look at this image and talk a little bit about your processing next, but. One of the things that you commented to me is you talked about problem solving and mentorship. And you and you the way you described it to me, at least the way I heard, was this is kind of the real heart of trying to figure things out, you felt. So I don't know if that was accurate, but can you just speak to that, Anthony, in terms of your thoughts about kind of it, it, it's a it's a community type of approach to this hobby, right? Yeah, and I, I find there are there are good instances and bad instances in my experience. There's, I think there's a lot of times when you ask a question and immediately everybody jumps to, oh, well, it's that problem. And you can, and you know, it's not that problem. You might be experiencing something else. And so there's sort of these cut and dried answers for the typical problems, but then you can have a, a next level version of a problem that exhibits similarly to the simple thing. Right. So you get those kinds of scenarios you get yeah. um the thousand wrong answers right that everybody you know i i come from a background in in bicycle uh, repair and running bike shops and everybody nobody knows how bicycle wheels work actually there's a book written on this i mean the people know <laughs> right there's actual physics and engineering that explains how a bicycle wheel how it work but if I had a nickel, well, I probably do actually have a nickel for every bike mechanic who explained how the wheel works incorrectly. And it was people with years of experience. And so, you know, there's, I see all the time, somebody asks a question in, in some public forum online, you know, Facebook or, or I, I tend to be on Facebook more than cloudy nights. 
And then I see 10 wrong answers and I'm like, oh man, I'm just going to be another guy answering this poor guy's questions, but he's getting all these bad answers. Well, here, right. You know, and I know the right answer. I know for a fact, because I read three books about that particular right. thing, right? It's what I know. If I don't know, I'll back off and I'll say, it might be this, but you might want to look into it. But when I right. know a right answer and I see three wrong answers, and that's just, it's tough. Well, because, we, who am I? I'm just some guy. Right, right. right. Well, Mr. Rat, he went out last weekend and he thought he was going to have to contact support about his mount giving oblong stars. And then he took a look, he took it out of lunar mode. Yeah. Oh, so man. Lost the entire That's night. Super set. frustrating. So, yeah. So things, it's a lot, there's a lot involved when you're doing astrophotography. A lot, a lot of things to look at. That plays directly into a guy who was having trouble. And I saw his guy graph. And that was exactly the guy graph I had when I was still in lunar mode and trying to guide. <laughs> So you get That's what all these your RA are, on one yeah. side, and they're all the same height. All the yeah, ones. yeah. That's but your where point these forums are great. Well, it, so about the forums, Anthony, your point is, and I found this to be because I'm a pretty regular contributor to the PhD forums. I'm a personally a pretty pretty regular visitor and contributor to the Pix Insight for Beginners on Facebook. There's just a everyone asks a question. There's a million answers, mm -hmm. and they all sound <laughs> equally plausible, right? right? And some are just flat wrong. Well, and I don't mean to call you out, Brian, but we had there was there was an instance where I was. This is it's such a, a good example of like uh -oh. simplicity. <laughs> so there. Well, how do I turn him off? I got to mute this thing. <laughs> right. There's a best practice when you're gonna calibrate to bump your mount north. Right. I don't know if you remember this. This was probably a year or more, more than that ago. And I said, well, do I hit the up button on the mount or do I, do I slew it north? Because depending on which side of the meridian you're on, north could be the down button mm -hmm. to move the, the mount so it actually slews across the side of the north. And you said, well, to the north, regardless, you know, always north, not the up button. And uh, oh, what are the guys uh, from, from PhD2? Uh, there's two guys. Andy Bruce and, and, Bruce, and Andy, Bruce. rather. Bruce chimed in just after that, and he said, no, up button. And he would know, right? He's writing the software, so he knows which direction they're asking you to do it because of how they're going to, how they run their calibration routine within the software. And he, he corrected you. He's polite and gentle about it. But that's, I mean, north is north, right? It always says north in the directions. It doesn't say the up arrow, right? But they're running it based upon the hardware going this direction and then that direction and interpretation you know, of everything. <laughs> well, in different mounts, if you flip side of the Meridian require you to reverse guiding, if I'm not mistaken, right. the, the low right. sandy doesn't. But so I think there are variations on some of these themes. Right. And, exactly. And, but I'll bet ASCOM knows how to treat this mount versus that mount or PhD two knows how to treat it through ASCOM or whatever, because they've had yeah. to deal with these issues. Right. Well, that's, so, yeah, that's the, that's the advantage of pulse guiding through ASCOM is that it reports the sky position. So if you do change side up here, it knows a PhD knows to reverse uh, the direction on the, the guiding as, as it's, as it's needed. And if you have a rotator, which I do uh, in my um, remote telescope, it will actually, if you, if you slew to a different target and rotate it, cause you know, rotating, of course, the guide camera is going to invalidate your calibration. If mm -hmm. you have a rotator, it will, uh, compensate for the new angle as well. So PhD is a really smart and savvy bit of software. I, mm -hmm. I think PhD two as a piece of software and Andy and Bruce as humans give me hope for all of humanity. And I mean that, <laughs> I mean that in the, the truest sense that. Oh, Bruce, hopefully Bruce, they're watching. Bruce worked through, he has a little separate app called PH Dither, PhD Dither. That yeah. was useful for me when I was still using my Pentax because Pentax doesn't pair with any of the software that's on the market for uh, astrophotography. So you're on your own. You're not tethered with that camera. Right, but I wanted to start dithering, which absolutely I needed to do with an uncooled uh, DSLR. Um, and so there's this little app, and it's great, but it does it acts exactly like a virus as far as Windows and, and other antivirus software is concerned, which is it appears out of nowhere, tells your computer to do something, and then shuts down. So uh, I was having some some conflicts with software and 
And he's he said, look, if you're willing to work through this, I, I'm I want to fix it. I said, right. well, I don't want you to put I don't want to put you out for my dumb problem. And he's like, I think yeah, I don't think there's a lot of people who use that app, frankly. But he worked through it with me, and it worked. It worked great. Last I haven't used it since I stopped using my Pentax, but it, right, it, it it worked great. And I, those guys, the you've got these companies, Microsoft. I do Facebook marketing stuff, and have to deal with Facebook or, or Google. You know, these are the biggest companies in the world. These two guys for free, and they won't even take anything. Will answer your question typically within minutes, if at worst hours. And right. they could be the dumbest wow. question ever about PhD too. And, and their customer support for free blows away the big, big, biggest companies in the world. So many people get so much joy out of their product. I, I just think they're they're just phenomenal couple of guys. Yeah, hats off to, yeah. to Bruce and Andy for yeah. sure. I've only and there's heard a lot of people. things about them. There's a lot of people uh, who contribute that. I mean, uh, Bruce right now is kind of the driving force. Andy is certainly uh, uh, there as well. He's doing a little bit uh, more behind the scenes right now. But there's been a lot of people over the year. Craig Stark, who originally started PhD. uh, And there's a lot of folks who have contributed algorithms and things like that. Um, We convinced them to do multi-start, something I I and others have suggested. Well, we, uh, you know... Bruce and I had a conversation. So I'm a regular contributor in the PhD forums and Bruce and I were Uh chatting and um, Bruce had said, we kind of had this conversation about multi-star and Bruce was like, I don't, I just don't think it's going to make any difference. And I said, I'll tell you what, I've got four different telescopes. I've got, you know, about 12 different image scales. We can do it. Let's just try it. Let's just see what happens. And I think over the course of two or three weeks, he and I just exchanged, uh, uh, I gave him results. He gave me a new version of the software and we ran through everything from about half an arc second up to, I think maybe five, six arc seconds uh, per pixel. And consistently we saw probably a 15%, you know, maybe 20% sometimes improvement in guiding. And I think that experience convinced him that that was something that we wanted to uh, roll into PhD. And I thought that was a, fa- and it's a fantastic thing, right? I mean, it's an absolutely great uh, addition. Well, I have to say at the, at the available focal lengths and pixel scales that, that most the imaging scales that most current amateur setups are at and the, the relative qual- qualities of things like the, the G11 or some of those Mandy mounts, and maybe the, the, some of the other brands of mounts, that 15% is the difference between guiding below your resolution and guiding above your resolution yeah, a lot of times. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's a really, it was a key development, that particular one that, that benefited so many folks. So, and I, I you know, I, I, I was stressing Bruce and Andy, but there's a lot of, you know, uh, Sharp Cap and the guy who runs that, he has a free and a paid version. Um, I mean, Astro Bin. Salvatore is amazing. Yeah. What he does and how responsive he is, I think the community in general in astrophotography is, is really incredible. I mean, Astrobin blows Facebook out of the water for social media as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah. Cloudy, cloudy well, nice well, does. And those Anthony wants to be now. Astrobin famous, so everybody yeah, I want be, to join us. <laughs> not Instagram famous, but Astrobin famous. So please, if you do look at my images, give me a like, give me a thumbs up. Thanks. Well, we've got somebody from Portugal, Jorge Gomez. Uh, Do I say? Uh, hopefully, I said that right. Is it Jorge Gomez. I hope. There we go, maybe? Jorge Gomez <laughs> from hey, Portugal, Jorge. saying hi, hi Anthony. So, Howdy, hi George, Jorge. Yeah, thank you. So let's talk. Um, I want to get back to uh, the original image we talked about. Okay. Um, and let me, uh, I got to back up here. But we did talk about some of these processing notes. Um, let me find it. And uh, I do want to talk about this uh, because we did, when you won this image, I got a flood of emails of people saying like, how, how, how did this guy take this image? I mean, what's what goes into that? So, Anthony, maybe can you just walk us through a little bit of anything you want to say on the acquisition and then kind of a bit of the processing? The I hear a lot about the blues and the faint details. So anything that you want to tell us that kind of gives us some insight into how you approach this? So I, I have to give some props 
to Adam Block. I've been following along on his uh, tutorials. I'm on the fundamentals program right now. I'm considering upgrading to this Horizons, but he's really gotten me through. Um, I, I started off with, with Photoshop because my wife has it and it was free and, and it works well. And I still use Photoshop quite a bit. Um, right. But towards the end of my process, I'd previously been using Deep Sky Stacker, which is also another example of a great free tool to get you get you started at least. But um, so the Pixen site is amazingly powerful in the stacking and uh, um, rejection algorithm end of things and getting you a starting image. And then, so that's that's a big thing. I've also been using the NSG script uh, with the normalized scale gradient, which I had this, this quandary in my head, which was how do you account for, like NSG solved the problem that it's having, which is if I have a night where it's slightly, you get a little bit of smoke haze or a little bit of, of uh, it's not as clear as the next night, Right. Or um, there's some gradients because I'm shooting near the horizon, I'm getting a little bit of flagstaff in there or something like that. <laughs> it, how, do, how do I, you know, how do you deal with that? I mean, you can blink and you can make some subjective decisions. Most of my decisions previous to this were on full with half maximum, which is a nice starting place, but it's not really, the, that's har hardly the best metric to use for keeping or, disc or, or discarding frames. And not only that, a lot of the rejection can deal with a little bit fuzzier stars pretty well and still get you better signal to noise. So that NSG sure. script is phenomenal in that it uses a photometric solution. It measures the stars and then it measures the sky around those stars. And it knows what all the stars are supposed to be, how bright they are relative to one another. So not only frame to frame, but throughout your frame. Right. It, it gives you a corrected frame for each of your subs but then also weights each of your subs relative to one another or relative to your, your, uh, your re reference frame. So that, is and that, and by the way, that is, uh, so it's the normalized scale gradient script. Correct. It's yeah. right now, uh, in version 2.1, I think was the latest. It's not part of the normal Pix insight distribution. You actually have to go, find the guy and dig it up and install it because in this last release of Pix Insight, they decided they wanted to go back to their local normalization routines and integrated that in with the WBPP processes. Yeah, you're right. And I'm still waiting to hear from Adam really, because I, I haven't used local normalization at all. And I'm, I'm hoping he's going to produce some stuff on that, which I think he's working on uh, with the new, the new WPP script. Uh, WBPP script. The um, and I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but I did finally set up Pix Insight properly in <laughs> with the nice. where my folder should be yesterday, and I was doing it all right. wrong, which was frustrating me. But the um, the uh, NSG script does it is included the updates in if I'm understanding correctly the um the uh, library for Pix Insight. There is a local normalization piece that also gets you the ability to use NSG with dithering, if you like, that is a separate install and you have to pay John for that. So Right. I, so then, that's that's true. It is not included as a normal part of the Pix Insight distribution now. They took it out. Uh, because yeah. they wanted to focus on local normalization, but you, it is when you go to his website, uh, John, the author of the script, uh, you download it and you have to install it. And then actually it's done through the repository function in Pix Insight, right? So once you sort of put that repository in there, it will constantly update it. And you're okay, right. So there that's, is. That's what I was seeing. And so, yeah, once yeah. it's there, it'll go update yeah. itself and the new version it needs to reinstall, I guess. So that was right. So, so th to come back to my process and how I work. So I really, I try to start any, the way my whole approach to this is that if, if I have to fix it later, something that I could have done earlier, I should have been doing it earlier. So, that all starts with equipment and setup and trying to guide in only shoot on the best nights and some other things like that, right? 
the right. hardware aspect of it and the capture aspect of it. But then what I've been trying to do is push any problems er as early on in the process as possible. So, you know, I still do use, um, uh, oh, what's, the, what's the process called where you click all around the screen and then it, it's- Oh, uh, like dynamic background extraction? Yeah, dynamic background extraction. I, I still use that. But don't use DBE when NST could have fixed it earlier on and at a more rudimentary level at a little more pure level. So that's sort of my general approach to things. And so NSG really helped with that. And I and the picks in sight and how it does stacking. And then at this really high number of, of subs that I tend to to get it, right. you know, some of those algorithms like that student do the studentized deviation thing. Those things seem to be pretty magic in 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 uh, smallening up the stars a bit and getting rid of all the satellites and all the other that kind of noise. <clears throat> so that I use PixInsight for that. Then I'll I'll do some DBE, and then uh, photometric <clears throat> color calibration is magical and based in reality, which I love. You know, measures all the stars, uses the white galaxy to set your color balance. And then from right. that point, you know, there's a lot of tools and in, in Picks and sites that are great. Um, I'll mess around with the stretch and, and, and star removal stuff, re, re uh, integrating stars. I uh, I recently I've been working so hard to reintegrate stars, and I recently learned that I've been doing it all wrong, and there was a real simple way to do it. And for one tiny little thing, and what about a block video that it wasn't even the point of what he was teaching? I was like, oh, well, yeah, maybe I should do that. Okay, so now, well, now you just have to tell us what that is. So I'm not even going to get into how I was reintegrating stars because it was really complicated. But uh, basically, if you just use, um, and it's in Photoshop and in PixInsight, if you use um, screen. and then, The screen transfer function, right. No, just I mean, not, screen. sorry, There's screen blend, blend mode. Blend mode, yeah. And then you readjust your uh, your stretch and you're good. The problem was when I was uh, originally doing this in Photoshop using screen, you go to screen and everything would look too bright and blown out. And so I thought, well, that's not the right blend mode. So I wouldn't do that. So anyway, I, I, if I tried to explain the way I was reintegrating stars before, everybody would just laugh at me and call me names. So I don't do that. <laughs> but yeah, you just use screen and you can select how bright you want your stars to be. You know, you make a layer where you just stretch it as much as you want your stars stretched and yeah, and screen. And then you mess with your histogram a little bit. And there you go. You bet. Uh, Bob's your uncle, as they say. So. You, uh, you sent this to me previously. <laughs> this is you described your <laughs> process for the image. You may, you may want to walk us through this just briefly. Yeah, so I mean, it sort of says what I was just saying, right? That you you want to try to address, do a good job stacking and 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 uh, and integrating, and and then you're you'll have less problems to deal with later. But in this line, I will say, the more I do it, the more straight my line gets. I am far more apt to do a whole lot of pixel insight and then a, a little bit of Photoshop. Yeah, I think a couple images ago, I there was some green still in there, so I dragged a tiff back from Photoshop to pixel insight to use SDNR. Um, but, uh, you know, the idea I think for all of us is to try to get that line to be a little straight, but I think this is really what a lot of us wind up doing, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's something like that. And, and, uh, and of course, then we all wind up with Hubble quality pillars of creation images, right? right? Right. Yeah. I like to describe my process as a very well considered methodical process where I do everything by the book and do all these things. And at the end, I just kind of just you know, get Photoshop filters out and try to fix all the problems that I had before. And it ends up being kind of this just free for all, you know, I, I will say having started with Photoshop and become uh, very adept with um, layers and masks allows me to do a lot of things uh, to really fine tune images at the end. And I, actually my background right now in this image we're talking about is a prime example of that. You know, I think I've, I often wind up a little overzealous with star reduction. You wind up with your bright stars being bright, but not having any any kind of glow or halo. Sure. And so it, an earlier version of this image, uh, that star that's over my shoulder there, there just wasn't enough glow to the extent it almost looked like it was it was a bit hollow, like it had a dark ring around it. So yeah, I was able to bring just this image back into, you know, reopen my Photoshop, my PSD, 
duplicate the layer, put the top layer, have a mask on it, the layer behind brightened it up and just paint a little bit through to allow some of that glow to come through. And that was, that's easy peasy. So to be able to chase little, little problems like true photo touch up stuff, um, it's nice to have that skill set in Photoshop as well. PixInsight is very much, you set the, the size and shape of the box and the color of the box and you throw the thing in the box and it spits out something right. on the other end. Right. And, and it's, it's very powerful. It's an awesome tool. But Photoshop really, I think, allows you to do a little bit of that artistic stuff. How much, how much glow do I run around my stars without yeah. having to run a thousand iterations of slider changes and things? And, um, sure. Uh, in fact, I'll just share with you briefly because you made me think of an image that I recently finished myself. Um, but this star, uh, it's got a lot of glow, but the amount of glow I had originally, and I'm, I'm sad I missed this because it, it was, it, it kind of illuminated about two thirds, well, maybe about half of the frame. It didn't overwhelm the galaxy, but it really gave a sense that this galaxy was behind the star and I, and I botched it. I mean, this is sort of my final version for the moment, but it's really hard to get subtle star processing. That's like probably where I am right now. It's like one of the hardest things to do. Yeah, it's the thing I, I'm challenged constantly. You know, I see images and I'm like, like trying to find that balance between having your stars look sharp and crisp, but not like little white circles or little blue, whatever color circles. Right. Retaining right. star color, but not having it just be a fringe of color around. And by no means do I feel like I have this stuff all dialed, but. These are the challenges, right? These are the things you're constantly chasing. I think, you know, if, if you could go to, you, if you see the stars in this image, but then I, I think it's my next image. It's um, Flaming Star Nebula. Um, this is where I yes. really figured out how to dial down stars because I, I knew Flaming Star, there's a lot of stars around Flaming Star Nebula. And so this image, I feel like I almost overdid my star reduction. I know everybody likes to have like three stars and they're, they're, I, I like stars. They're part of what's in space, right? And the current right. vogue is really to have have overdue stars. But I feel like I kind of overdid the star reduction in this a little bit, right? I'm, I'm happy with it. But it, it was the first time I was confident in knowing how to do it. So I just went for it. <laughs> so now I have a, a process for that. But I also like the, the image we were just looking at in that, you know, here's all the stars. They're not overwhelming the, the nebula. Right. You still want to see that. But it's nice to highlight those stars. Part of this image actually was to highlight these. Uh, I'm pointing at the screen like anybody can see me, but to highlight the, the five stars uh, on the yeah, right hand over side. Here. And that, that's, yeah. that's how I frame that. I wanted to bring those guys out because I think that's a neat little. I don't yeah, even know yeah. that it's actually a cluster. They may be entirely unrelated to one another, but I like them as their own feature in this part of the sky next to the flaming. Star Nebula itself. I it's, think it's yeah, it's style. a nice, uh, it's a nice composition. I just want to point out, Jamie's joined us. Hey, Jamie, good to see you. I, I know. Hi, Jamie. Better late than never. Okay, nice. but this will be you. You you won't be able to see it live and chat with us, but you'll be able to watch it on Facebook and YouTube. Is that correct? Yeah, the, it'll be the rewind. Yeah, so this will be okay. uh, available as a as a permanent thing. So you can you can see everything, Jamie. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool because so, I can share this with my mom, you know, to cover the Rolling Stone and all. <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything else uh, processing-wise that you want to talk about? Or we're we're going to bring it to a close here real quickly. So I want to say if there's anybody who has any last questions or things for Anthony, now's the time to ask them. We'll put them up uh, through the comments section on our uh, live stream here. But I want to uh, these um, are commend uh, Jamie for biking with the kids. It's good to get the kids out biking. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, That's look at that. Here he said. <laughs> <laughs> and he lives, I I think he lives somewhere in the Santa Cruz area. He's got a beautiful, you know, I see redwoods oh, behind good, good his house and everything. There, yeah. Really makes me angry. I mean, uh, makes me happy for him. Um, so, Anthony, you've got, uh, I'm just kind of looking at these here. Now, what are all these stars here? I mean, these little tiny stars, are these like a, pick, a top pick from uh, Astrobin? Yeah, those are top picks, and I live for that. So, <laughs> I mean, there's just tons of them in here. This is fantastic. Yeah, no, no image of the day. I need to get an image of the day, right? Yeah. I, I think I think once I get that, I you know, I'll quit. I was joking with the guys at Star Arizona. Adam Block said something nice about one of my pictures, and uh, they said, oh, now you can quit. But no, I still need an <laughs> image of the day. There you go. Let's get, let's get that for you. Yeah. 
Okay. This was, my uh, first, this was my first top pick, and this was actually my first. Um, I think this was my first image with that Quattro, and this is that F four, and um, this was only thirteen hours. I, you know, I think that was a I was challenged only. by. Um, <laughs> right. Well, geez, I just saw somebody six hundred and seventy hours on something recently. Uh, it was one of those that, that there's these guys who uh, these couple of guys uh, uh, on uh, Astro Ben are always finding new planetary nebula. Oh, I right, yeah, right, I saw yeah. those guys. It was a couple. It was a binary star thing, right? That's yeah, that was seventy yeah. hour monster. That was a neat thing. Yeah, I um, saw that. Unbelievable. So uh, anyway, this was my first image with the Quattro. One of my one of my earliest images with the astronomy camera, and I'm just going to say that if you're still shooting with the DSLR get one of these astronomy cameras i there's some stuff i i was i knew i once i shot this or a couple of images with that new camera i realized it was i was up against the camera not not i was getting everything i could get out of that and it wasn't enough so yeah um, there's something to be said about good cameras become invisible as well right you no longer can you no longer worry about things like calibration and noise and all that stuff it's because they just become invisible because they're so good well right here here's a great juxtaposition if, if you want to go back to my main screen here and uh i want to show you the last image i shot with my pentax through the telescope um okay scroll down it's terrible but i want everybody to see it and see what it is so that right uh, i'm pointing at it that ghost nebula between mars and uh saturn this one here yeah if you could click on that so it's summertime, it's warm, and I'm shooting with an uncooled um, DSLR with uh, no, with you know the stock filters that come in a DSLR, the Killier Red. And so that was my my Ghost Nebula. That was the last one, and I I cannot tell you what I did to try to get sensor noise down on this image. It was just frustrating and frustrating. And uh, yeah, and finally, wow. And so that. So anyway, if you zoom, if you go back out and go to more my more recent Ghost Nebula, that was this last summer. This was two summers ago, and then right. And that, how much time did you put on that Ghost Nebula? Um, I do know it's similar for both, although not identical. So if you want to click second row, that Ghost Nebula. No, no, not that Ghost Nebula. Oh, the, sorry. The, the Ghost this one here. Yeah, that one. That not Cassiopeia, but so this was me reshooting that this last summer, still warm. Uh, scroll down, we can see how much time, because I know they were similar, but this is with the ASI 2600 MC Pro, cool camera, so it deals with the Just noise. Just astonishing, yeah. No no red cut filter, um, you know, just design, and that, that sensor that's in there, I think it's a Sony. Scroll down a little bit, I want to see Brian, do you want to mention, oh, okay. It was, I was uh, like, dude. A little bit more, just down to the time. Oh uh yeah so 20 hours 20 yeah, hours 20 i think hours. the other one was 18 but that two hours on that pentax wasn't big so yeah um did you brian do you see jamie's comment there his simpleton process i don't know if you want to mention that uh so let's see he says uh so here's my simpleton process uh weighted batch processing stretch while holding control uh transfer stretch using histogram adjust color done uh, so I don't get much, if any, dust. Is there a simple process for getting dust? You mean removing dust, Jamie? I'm not really sure kind of I what you're getting at. Space dust, right? Space dust. Oh, okay. you, yeah, for getting some of these dark nebula, maybe? So you only get rid of dust just flat. But <laughs> shoot flat. Um, or maybe blow your stuff off at some point. Yeah. Don't do what I do. It's probably bad, but it works. I have a compressor. So anyway, don't do that. Um the, uh, but no, I, I don't, I, Jamie, I'd, I'd have to say, I don't know how much time you're shooting for and, but yeah, use a nice camera and, and time will get more dust, more time equals better dust, more exposure, yeah. time, more integration, not necessarily longer exposures. And, um, oh, the gentleman who, who makes sharp cap, I'm forgetting his name, but he far and away has the best explanation of what your exposure time should be from that uh, it might have been right. AIC last year or something but but integrate total integration time yeah yeah so jamie was talking about space dust and again I, i'm assuming that sort of mean like the either the dark nebula or the bright nebulas uh those in my experience just take a lot of time and really you know the darker the skies the better because they are so close to 
the background noise that you really need either a lot of time or very dark skies to separate them. Uh, otherwise, you just kind of it gets lost in the in the stretch, right? Yeah, I, I think dark skies for sure because you, you need that contrast, right? And so if you have, in fact, I've had images. This is entirely anecdotal. It was when I was still shooting a DSLR, but I added time and got less dust because I was shooting with less transparent skies. So the, yeah. the 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 better nights with better transparency were yielding a better result with less total integration. Got it. Okay. Um, Do you so want to? Are, are we going to go ahead, Tanya? Uh, are we going to show um, Anthony's uh, t-shirts? Do we oh, have time for that? Job, yeah. Thank you, you to, for reminding me. So that? yeah, this will be really quick, and then we'll let everybody go. But um, yeah, let's. I'd love to show off his t-shirt. So great, a Anthony. Tell us, tell us about this here. So I'm sort of semi-retired, and you know, I can only. I have a one-shot color camera, so half. You know, two out of three nights, I can't really shoot because of the moon. So I, I and my wife's graphic designer, and I've done sort of half-ass graphic design and brand development for uh, bike shops primarily. For years, so I was like, oh, I had, and I have dumb ideas for memes and designs all the time, <laughs> things that I think are funny and maybe nobody else does. But so it's free to start one of these threadless shops. So I did, and I've been making some fun astrophotography or astronomy focused stuff. And um, right, I, some of it's pretty fun, some of it's a little goofy, some of it's <laughs> historic. But I, I think I have something for I everybody. I love it. And, yeah. Um, so this I, one, you were just, we were just poking at this before that, that started, but it says natural light. And then it says LRGB OSC in there as a little. Yeah. So obviously that's my bias is a little bit more <laughs> towards those natural colors and stuff. And I, I saw somebody wearing a natural light t-shirt online. So where I was like, oh, that would be funny, you know? So I took their logo and, and doctored it up. That is oh, funny. that's funny. Nat, natty light. Natty I didn't light. know that was yeah, a thing. Yeah. yeah, and you have some baseball versions of, and that's your asteroids. There yeah, the yeah. Team there ast we go. asteroids with the that's, asteroids number and name on the back. I like, love oh, that. Yeah. yeah, Those are fun. That's clever, clever. And you have all women's, it looks like women's, men's, kids, all the above, huh? Yeah, this is a fun thing about the Threadless store is you just put your designs up there and then you choose whatever uh, yeah. shirts. They're all printed to order. I don't make very much money on these it's just really for fun and if anybody buys one i'm going to be more excited about them wearing the shirt than the <laughs> right. dollars i'm going to make on it so exactly. newtonian there you go i gotta yeah. that's I like gotta... us that, yeah that's why we're giving away the t-shirts with our mounts and the image of the month if you are win on our um which anthony you got your t-shirt right oh yeah i love my love yeah. Yeah. shirt that's a fun yeah. design actually people um, really really enjoy it so yeah it's we're, we're going to continue with it mm -hmm. yeah um yeah, one of the other t-shirt designs I have up there and, and just maybe a small amount of explanation is the uh, did you dither? So that, yes. that you know, if you've if anybody's seen the movie The Hangover, there's uh, uh, the, the phrase, he says, oh, but did you die? You know, and of course the <laughs> phrase in astrophotography is dither or die. Did you dither? <laughs> right, dither or die. So, there you go. So this is good, but did you dither? Because that's, not, you know, why do I have this walking noise problem? Did you dither? That's one of my favorite movies, by the way. I love that movie. <laughs> it's a fun movie. Yeah. Well, that's so this is great. by the way, is this Newtonian yours? That looks like a G11 in your setup. Is that correct? That is my scope. However, I to, in full disclosure, that is the, the Los Mandy mount, but I uh, didn't want to put it on a pier because I didn't think it looked as good. So I found an image from the Los Mandy site of the tripod and photoshopped it back in place of the mount. Perfect. I need to get one of these for Scott. Get out your calipers. That might be off a little bit. I'm just saying. I need to get one for Scott for sure. Don't don't tell us how the sausage is made. So let's enjoy yeah, the sausage exactly. there. There you go. There it is. Oh, that's great. Okay, Tanya, how we're wrapping this up? So how are we, we going are. to? Pick a uh, T-shirt winner. Oh, okay. Um, I, maybe I. Sh gosh, maybe I should do it. Okay, I, maybe just scroll and open my eyes and pick the middle one. Should I do that? Sure. Okay. Why not? All right. Here we go. It's Don Romero. So if you contact Tanya at lostmandy.com, Tanya K at lostmandy.com, let me know your T-shirt size, and I'll get one of these T-shirts out to you, Don. 
We appreciate you listening. Congratulations. She does have wow. one other question, but I'm not going to, we need to close up now and, but we'll try to get the, we'll try to get your last question answered. And, um, if we can, if it's, it's really, if it's, so, um, we'll do that, but Don, you know, email Tanya K at lostmandy.com. Tell me your t-shirt size and we'll get that t-shirt out to you and your address. I need your I address just also. Interject, Don. I will tell you this T-shirt improved my guiding by about a quarter <laughs> arc second RMS. So wear this shirt while you're imaging, and you're a little sharper star. It, it will improve. Your I love guiding. it. I love Results it. not guaranteed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay. Anthony. Okay. Anthony, you've been. It's been great. great. And we really enjoyed, thank you for taking the time. It's almost three you know, we're going on an hour and 40 minutes, uh, yes. but we really appreciate that you took the time to not only show us your images, but talk through your processes and the things you've done to troubleshoot and so forth. We really appreciate that. We really Thanks, and I'm always yeah. willing to help somebody if I can. So you can track me down on Astro Bin or, or wherever I, I'm on a line under my own name. So um, you've heard, you heard it. Yeah, and and yeah, give me those. Astro been famous. Give me those likes on there, guys. Appreciate it. All right, there you go. Trade likes for for uh, uh, advice. Advice. That's good. <laughs> so we are going to sign off. Uh, thank you, everybody, thank you, everybody, for everybody. being on. It's been fun. And, uh, we'll we'll, we'll see you at AIC time. next month, May twentieth, at the live stream. We're going to announce some stuff in there. Yes. See you there. All right. Awesome. Take care. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>